for your word. Lord, you're so good. Your word is so wonderful. You're so pleasant. Lord, how good it is to dwell with you, Lord, in your word. Hallelujah. Oh, it's good to see everybody here. It's so much fun. I love the Word of God. <coughs> Excuse me. So I've been praying, Lord, what do you, Lord, what do you want us to do? Had many ideas, but I want to just, Holy Ghost, you just show me. Holy Ghost, you just lead me. Lord, show me what you want us to do. And so I, I'm going to do 1 John because it was what I talked about last time. And, you know, we've done, we've done uh, Daniel, we've done Romans, we've done um, James, we've done Galatians, and we did the pre-Adamite world, that's a little different. We did Galatians, so I, you know, we could have done Paul again, but I wanted to do something different. So I want to do 1 John. I mean, but an important thing about this is we're going to see in 1 John is that it's really a structure that follows the same as all the writings of everybody else in the New Testament. It's the same structure. Different words, slightly different order, but if you look at it, it's going to harken back to many things we've already done and things that we haven't done that are in there. Here we haven't done them, but you've all read them, and we're going to see that. And 1 John is sort of an encapsulation of everything that God is saying, and it's said succinctly and clearly and most powerfully to just cut to the heart of the matter. This is written, if you think about it, this is written when John's really old. He's like 90 years old, thereabouts. I'm not sure exactly, but he's up there. Probably at this point, he's the last living of the 12 disciples of Jesus. He's been through a lot. And yet there he is writing this book to the church. And he writes this thing, and it's sort of the summation, the, the, the condensed version, the concentrated, you know, evaporated milk, you know, it's down to just the bare bones of it. All the excess is taken out. It's the, it's the cream given to you. So that's why I think we should do 1 John. So it begins this way, and, and it's also good as we start here, if you haven't already, start applying yourself to memorizing it. Okay, people memorize in different ways, but just applying yourself to doing it. You just, just, just begin to make a habit of it. Take a verse, take two verses, take a section, and just spend time memorizing it. And you may feel like weeks later you've forgotten it again and you can't remember exactly how it went, but you kind of know a little bit. But the more you do it, the stronger and stronger it gets. I mean, most of us have the experience, because it's been in the Word enough, that if I got up here and started saying it incorrectly, it wouldn't sound right to you. Well, that's the first step. You recognize, okay, wait, 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 that's not quite right. But you're having a little trouble with how is it exactly right? And, and so you can learn. But you can memorize, some people like to memorize sections. Like a lot of the things that I know in the Word of God, I know about where they are based upon that he talks about this and then he talks about like Romans. I, I know he talks about everybody's concluded under sin. Then he talks about justification by faith. And then he talks about how why one offering. And then he talks about how what we are made in Christ Jesus. Then he talks about what life was like under the law. Then he talks about where we are now and no condemnation. I got all those chapters sort of broken out in my mind. But the detailed words I haven't necessarily memorized to the point that I know every word. But that's a good step. So you kind of know where you can quickly find it in your Bible at any time. And you kind of know what the basic themes are. And then you start to quake, oh yeah, I remember. That's what it says. So anyway, just encouraging you to try to memorize 1 John. So this is a good step in that direction. John. That which was from the beginning. What is he declaring to us? He is not declaring to us something new. He's declaring to us that which was from the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So that which was from the beginning. Okay, and this is I was just the simple, these first greetings, very important to understand the context of where we are. We're in a place where we're talking about something from the beginning. That was from the beginning, which we've heard, 
we've heard it, which we have seen with our eyes and which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. So the greeting is, I'm going to tell you about something from the beginning. I'm going to tell you about the life. This is the life that's manifested to you. So that's, keep that in mind, because that's what this book is about. <clears throat> Jesus is the life. <clears throat> what else is he? <clears throat> Excuse me, something stuck in my throat. Forgive me. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except by him. Right? You know that? That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. That's who our fellowship's with. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. Pretty intense, pretty awesome. This is again the purpose. We're gonna to declare to you, that's from the beginning, we're gonna to declare to you the life that life that's with the fellowship that we have with the Father and with the Son, and that we're going to do it so your joy may be full. Okay, now we all understand the whole purpose of the book. This is important stuff. A lot of times you go pick out a scripture somewhere, we start reading chapter 3, you, and you forget what the purpose is, you, you kind of miss it a little bit. Okay, this then, verse f chapter 1, verse 5, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, notice that up there he was saying our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. If we say we have this fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not do the truth. So we know right away, no walking in darkness allowed. We got that clear, right? No walking in darkness. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Isn't that intense? That's awesome. I mean, I just, I absolutely love this. Everything you need to know practically is all in the first chapter of First John. Everything you need to know. Now listen to this one. This one trips people up a lot. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Wait a minute. I'm supposed to have no darkness. And now you just said, if we say we have no sin. And this causes people to be confused. To be one of the scriptures, people tell you, how can you say that your sins have all been taken away? How can you say you have no sin? If you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself. That's what people will say to you. So let's think about where else in the scripture is this very kind of thing used. I mentioned it early on that, that 1 John basically follows a pattern that's very similar to the one I just laid out for you in Romans. Okay? Romans chapter 3, somewhere in the middle, says this. Basically, actually I better look at it because I don't want to misquote it. Back to that, uh, what we were talking about. Let's go to Romans chapter 3. Actually, it'd be further before that because that's the conclusion. My computer's slower. Yes, verse 10. As it is written... There is none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understands. There's none that seeks after God. They are all gone out of the way. They're all together become unprofitable. There's none that does good, no, not one. Their throat's an open sepulcher. With their tongues they've used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. I mean, he's concluding it's pretty messed up, right? Now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, for what purpose? That every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. That was the purpose. To show to the people under the law their guilt. To show to them their sin. Show to them what their need was. So now if we go back, well, since we're here, and you mentioned, we, we should mention to it, 23, the summary of it is, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all should know that scripture, Romans 3, 23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Why is that important? Because it's important when we go back to 1 John 
and we look at this scripture that we just said is the first one that trips people up all the time. We say, I have no sin, we deceive ourselves, the truth is not in us. It is talking about this issue. If you say that you have no need of a redeemer, if you say that you have no need of Jesus, if you say that you did not need your sins taken away, you are a liar. The truth is not in you. If you say that I never needed to be forgiven, you are a liar. The truth is not in you. Okay? It is important for us to understand that there is a place where we must come to recognize our guilt before God and that we have need of somebody to take that filthy stain away. So if we say that we have no need of a Redeemer, we deceive ourselves, the truth is not in us. In like manner, having had my sins washed away, having had myself be made brand new, having received this glorious life that's in Christ Jesus, this fellowship that we have with him, will I need Jesus in the future? The answer is absolutely yes. I need him. I must have him. My very life is in him. So if I say that I have no need of him, I'm a liar. I do not ever, at no point in my life could I ever stand before God without him. That's what this is referring to. It's referring to that bigger picture question that everybody has need of a redeemer and that for the rest of your life you have need of a redeemer. Why, because you're a constant sinner, constantly falling, backsliding? No, not because of that, albeit that may happen to people for a season. Not because of that, but because you only stand before God in Him. He's your very life. All my life is in Him. All my righteousness is His. All my joy is in Him. He's everything to me. He is my very living, and therefore I will need Him forever. It's pretty intense when you think about it. So, when we read the scripture, we've just concluded that we have fellowship with him. We've concluded there's no darkness in him. We've concluded that if we say that we have fellowship and walk in darkness, we're liars. Then it says, but if you, have, you say you have no sin, you're a liar. Well, that just doesn't seem to make sense until you understand by looking at other places besides Romans, where the conclusion is everybody under sin. Does everybody understand? Can you follow that? You want to get to the point where you can easily, very quickly, make that argument. When somebody says to you, well, right here it says, if you say you have no sin, absolutely I need Jesus every day. Absolutely I walk with him every day. Absolutely he's my life every day. Absolutely he's my righteousness every day. Just say it that way. Just agree with the scripture. He is my, it's all I need. Okay, let's go on. Let's see what the next thing says. If you confess your sins, so if you have sinned, if you confess that he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you've been cleansed from all unrighteousness, is there any darkness in you? No. no. Do you have any sin if you've been cleansed from all unrighteousness? No. So if you sin, confess your If we sin, we have an advocate with the Father who is Jesus Christ the righteous. We're going to read that in a minute. Verse 10, if we say we've not sinned, we make him a liar and the word is not in us. If you go and start justifying sin, if I commit sin and then begin to say, I didn't really, it's not really sin to me. It's not, it's not my sin, it's, it's, my sin's all covered. It's not, a, it's not a problem. If you say you have not sinned, you make him a liar. If you sin, you sin. What are you supposed to do? It's going to tell us in a minute. But understand these scriptures. These are the two places where people get tripped up in 1 John. If you ask most people, the only scriptures they know in 1 John, if you say you have no sin, you're a liar. And, and that if you say you have not sinned, you make him a liar. This is the only scriptures they know. But we need to understand it in the context in which it's stated that the best context for it, in my opinion, if you want to go in detail, if people got time for it, just go to Romans and understand, and we've done that here, go through the detail of Paul's argument showing people where we all are, where we began, what happened to us. But the rest of 1 John is going to declare unto us the truth of how free from sin we really are. Okay, so we all, we all dealt with that? Does anybody, this is an important place for questions. Because I want to make sure that everybody here has an opportunity to make certain in their own heart that they get this. It's not hard. It's just knowing the scripture. Go ahead. So, so she asked, 
because like Peter, he was, John was particularly ministering to the Jews, or the Hebrews, at, at much of his ministry. He also did to the Gentiles. Um, and is he just, you know, is he speaking to Jews? Yes, he is, but also including everybody. Because remember the argument of Romans is to go in detail to, to conclude the entire world guilty before God. Remember, there was a dichotomy. There was a separation of two groups. There were the Gentile nations and there were the Jews. The Jews were the chosen people. What advantage then has the Jews? In many ways did they have an advantage because by them were the oracles of God given and, and to them was given the, the sanctuary and the tabernacle and all of the things that they had to what? Prepare a place for God to dwell in their midst. That was all given to them. So they had an advantage in that sense. But the conclusion is Jew or Gentile, bond or free, whoever you are, the conclusion is everybody's under sin. And that's really what this is talking about. We all have need of Jesus. Notice, remember we started, the first phrase is, that which was from the beginning. What happened in the beginning? He created everything. Life is in the Word. Jesus, Jesus was known as the Word, and God spoke the Word, and everything came into existence. He made everything that is made. There's nothing made, as we read in the beginning of the book of John, there was nothing that was made that was not made by Jesus. He, he did it all. And so we're declaring to you that life. Who brought life to the world? Jesus. The Father, as we often say, the Father declared it, the, the Word, I mean, the Father thought it, some people say, or the, the Father directed it, the Word spoke it, the Holy Ghost moved upon it. Everything came. They worked together to bring to pass life. All of life that was in the beauty of creation that God made was done by him. We're declaring that life to you, that life that was from the beginning, the life of Christ Jesus. And there is no darkness in that life. There's none. He has no darkness. Zero. And we have fellowship with him. By who? By Christ Jesus, because he's given us his life. How did he give us his life? He took his very life and he sowed it into the ground like you sow a seed. And out of that came much fruit. Out of that sowing of that seed, now everybody can be brought into that life. How am I brought in? Well, one example in John 15 is that I have a vine. Jesus said, I'm the vine. You are the branches. He's the life, the life-giving vine, and your branch is stuck into that life-giving vine. And you may have been a wild branch out here not hooked up to the life and you were taken and grafted in to the olive tree that is the, the life of God or into the vine of God and you've been brought in. And now if you bring forth fruit, he'll purge it back. So it brings forth more fruit. He's perfecting us as we go through our life, right? He's doing all of these things. That's the life that we're declaring to you. John is saying, I'm declaring to you this life, this life that was from the beginning. And so when we read these scriptures, if you say you have no sin, you have no need of a Savior, you're a liar. And if you sin and you start declaring that it's not sin to you and it's not something that's wrong, you're a liar. You make him a liar. It's really what you do. And that's a terrible thing. So we need to understand that these doctrines that people preach of how, well, there's, you know, everybody's a sinner all the time, is false. It's false. It's a lie. And we're going to see that just hitting the head in the rest of 1 John. There's also this doctrine that you'll hear people say, well, I'm a Christian, so I have the blood, and so when I sin, it's not sin. He doesn't see the sin, he only sees the blood. I mean, I've heard these things. Yeah. People say this kind of stuff, right? And they don't realize that what they're doing is contradicting the Word of God directly. For what purpose? Who knows? This is what they've been taught, many of them. It's all they know, and this is what they say. Because they can't get over the fact that they have a problem and they need to get redeemed. And if you find yourself falling into sin, don't justify it. If you say you've not sinned, you make him a liar. If you sin, you sin. But we beautifully, let's read the next thing. My little children, my little children, I'm declaring to you this life. These things write unto you that you do not sin. I'm gonna write to you, these things I'm writing to you, so you will not sin. That's the purpose. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. If you sin, admit it as sin, declare it for what it is, 
and get it right. Don't ever justify sin. Don't ever call it something other than what it is. Don't ever say, well, it's not really sin to me. It's okay, because I have Jesus. No, if it's sin, repent. When you've repented, you'll be free of the thing. When you justify it, it will stay with you and bother you for the rest of your life until you repent of it. That's how awful sin is. Sin is a horrible, destructive disease. It's the worst disease. The best example of it in the Old Testament was leprosy, as far as diseases go. Just, it, it's a canker that's eating away at you, causing you to just die a slow and ugly death over time. That's what sin is like. It's just insidiously awful. So if you, if you sin, we have an advocate. His name is Jesus Christ the righteous. He's my righteousness. I go to him, say, Lord, I've sinned, forgive me. I don't ever want to do that again. He washes me clean. Now I can go on with him. I can walk with him. And he, he, verse 2, is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. His sacrifice is sufficient for everybody who ever lived or ever will live on this earth. He's sufficient. You're included. And hereby, we do know that we know him. Here's how we know. You want to know if you know him. If we keep his commandments. That's very important. What are his commandments? Well, Jesus gave us a lot of commands. Told us to do a lot of things. Right? He did. Many, many commands. And we can read them. You can go read, Pastor Mark reminds us all the time, read 5, 6, 7 of Matthew. Right? Read it in Luke. You can read John. He commands Jesus. What was the most important command that he talked about? You need to love the Father with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, right? You need to love your neighbor and treat him like you'd want to be treated yourself. And, these things. and then he also commanded us to love our enemies. And he also commanded us to, to love one another with the same love he loved us with. He commanded us to lay down our lives. These are all commands. But he knows they're all centered around loving people. That's <laughs> the ones we're talking about. So anyway, so you hear that. He's, he's the propitiation. Hereby we know him if we keep his commandments. He that says, I know him, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Whoso keeps his word, in him truly is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. So he that says, says I know him, needs to keep his commandments, and we can say we're in him because the love of God is perfected. Do you know when you're in Jesus, all you have is love? There's absolutely no hatred in it. There's absolutely no neglect in it. None. None. Only love. He that says he abides in him, on himself so to walk even as Jesus walked, even as he walked. This is what you should do. You're going to say that you know him. You're going to say that you're in him. You're going to say you abide in him. You're going to keep his commandments and you're going to walk like he walked. Now that's pretty clear pretty clear. Brethren, I don't write a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shines. So the first commandment he's telling us is the word. So you, you got lots of commands in the old, we call it the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, the Hebrew Bible, whatever you want to call it. But in the, in, the, in the Word of God, there's a lot of commands on what you're supposed to do, right? There's a whole bunch of them. It tells you how to, to live. It tells you to love the Lord your God. It tells you to love your neighbor as yourself. It tells you to, to care for people and to care for the widows and to care for the orphans and to do... There's a lot of things that it tells you to do. <clears throat> Excuse me, that are important things. That's the old commandment. But again, I'm writing a new commandment to, to you, and he's going to spend some time on the new commandment. I read to you because which thing in, is true in him and in you because the darkness is past and the true light now shines. There is a day that they lived in where there was a lot of darkness. Today, the true light now shines. If Jesus is in me, the true light is in me. That's why Jesus looked at his disciples and, and, and to the people around him. You are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. Why? Because Jesus in them would shine out of them. Right? We're the light of the world. Out of us is supposed to flow the word of God to people and that does not return void. That word of God, it's the light of the world. Okay? 
he that loves his brother, verse 10, abides in the light, and there's none occasion of stumbling in him. Where have you heard that before? Peter. He that does these things shall never stumble. There's a whole list of things you're supposed to do, all based upon the commandments and the word of God. Verse 11, he that hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not worry, know where he's going because that darkness has blinded his eye. You have a place in your heart where you begin to think that you have hatred for somebody, envy against your brother, frustrated with them, unhappy with them, mad at them. Immediately begin to say, I'm not going to allow that thing to work in me. And you begin to pray. What do you ask? Lord, fill me with your love. Fill me with your love. We need to learn that everything we need comes from him. I spent many years, whether I meant to do it or not, thinking that what I needed to do was do it right myself. I had to get it right. I had to make it right. I had to be better than the rest. I had to, be, to be, meet up to a certain standard. Okay? I, had, I had to accomplish that. But I didn't read the word carefully that told me that he sent his word to accomplish all of that. He sent the Holy Ghost to accomplish all of that. He already did all of that. He's given me the power to do it. Not by my strength, but by his so that every time I see a need in my life, instead of going, I'm such a terrible, I'm, Lord, forgive me for being so messed up. Man, I wish I'd get more help around here, somebody to help me to do this better. Must be somebody else's fault anyway, because it's never mine, right? It's always somebody else's. You know, if they just treated me better, I wouldn't have reacted that way, and then everything would have been better. I mean, we, we do, we self-justify things this way. This is the deceptive, subtle power of the, of the powers of darkness. They do these things, right? But when I recognize that the power to keep his word comes from God, when I recognize that the empowerment to do what's righteous comes from the Holy Ghost, when I recognize that he will do in me that which needs to be happened, that needs to be perfected in me by the Spirit, I will then turn to him and say, Lord, I see again a need. I'm not loving like I should. Father, come fill me with your love. And if you sin, repent. Get it right. Now, Lord, fill me with your love. And then begin to love. He'll empower you to love. He will fill you with love that you do not have in yourself. Because the self will get easily deceived. All right, so that was the digression. But he that hates his brother, you hate your brother, we're going to read that one again, is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he's going. And that's the reason you get deceived like that is because you're walking around with your eyes covered, wondering why you keep bumping into things. And it, it's there, don't hate your brother, <laughs> ever. You find even the littlest bit of a shade of hating your brother, all you have to do is say, Lord, forgive me. I'll fill me up with greater love. Look at every single one of your brother and begin to say, Lord, fill me with even more love than I've ever known for each one. Lord, just the love of God coming forth to touch everybody around me. I write unto you, little children, verse 12, does that sound familiar? This is just like 2 1, right? Okay, always note things when, they, when you get repeated phrases like that. It's like, okay, we're going to talk about another subject. So they write unto you that you sin not. Now I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because you've known him that's from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you've overcome the wicked one. What is he talking about? There's a place where you come to greater revelation as you walk with him. First thing you need to know is your sins have been forgiven. They've been washed clean. You need to know that. Second thing you need to know you need, to know, you need to know God and the young men because you've overcome the wicked. I write unto you, little children, because you've known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because you've known him that's from the beginning. I've written unto you, young men, because you're strong and the word of God abides in you and you've overcome the wicked one. Why, why is he repeating himself? Notice the slight difference of tone here. He first of all says to you, little children, I write unto you because your sins are forgiven you. Then he says to them, um, I write unto you, little children, because you've known the Father. When you know the Father, who is the Father? I got to preach here one night just, just so overwhelmed with God on Exodus 34 and who he was and talking about the fact that he is loving and merciful and forgiving sins and that's who the Father is, who will in no wise clear the guilty. So when you see this, it says, I write into you little children because your sins are forgiven you. He will not clear the guilty, but he will forgive your sins. Why? Because of what Jesus did. He's going to forgive you your sin. He's so long-suffering that he waited. He kept them all in store until Jesus would come. All the ones who were righteous, who believed on him, who chose his ways, 
who hadn't, had, hadn't been really born again to the level we have, certainly didn't have the Holy Ghost like we have, and yet they were kept in a safe place in hell, in what we call sometimes Abraham's bosom, that place Jesus talked about when the rich man saw Lazarus over there being comforted by Abraham and wanted him to dip some cool, cool water on his tongue because he was in such torment, right? And said, go send Lazarus to go tell my brothers that they don't come to this horrible place. There was that place he kept him. Why? Because he's so loving and so forgiving. He works with us. He understands our, our need, but he is no way going to clear the guilty. You want to remain guilty? You're going to be guilty. When all provision's been weighed for your guilt to be washed away, because why? He's forgiven you. I've written unto you, young men, because you've known the Father. You've known how much the Father loves you. He loved, so loved the world, he sent his only begotten Son. Whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That life is what we're declaring tonight in 1 John. That life that he has promised to give unto us. And he, so he wrote unto the fathers, um, unto you fathers, because you've known him that's from the beginning. So you've now known him. So the, remember the little children here, um, their sins were forgiven and that they've known the father. And then he writes to the fathers because they've known him that's from the beginning. And then I have written unto you fathers because you've known him that's from the beginning. He says it again. You know, we need to know him, I think. Uh, it's, it's a little bit repetitive. I think knowing him would be important. Did you see the part back here earlier when he says if we say that we know him, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Oh, so that's what he's talking about. I've written unto you that you keep his commandments. You know the Father, and you've known the Father. I write unto you because you know you need to keep his commandments, and I write unto you because you've kept his commandments. This is what you need to do. And then the young man, he says, I write unto you young men in verse 13 because you've overcome the wicked one, and then he says in in uh, verse 14, I have written unto you, young men, because you're strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you've overcome the wicked one. Who, how do we overcome the wicked one? Blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. I have learned one of the best things to start talking to people about is how Jesus changed you, what he did for you. And it doesn't have to be long. It's very simple. I say all the time, I said, you would not have wanted to know me before. But that, who I was, and that, those things that I did, and those things that were not convenient, when I heard the word of Christ Jesus, and I called upon his name, and I was changed, my whole life became different. I was made brand new, and I like to always add in there that when I got home from where I was, my mother noticed I was different. You know, she knew something happened to you. Okay? Because it's real. It's a real change. Something happened. You can talk to people about your testimony. And you can ask the Holy Ghost how to say it in a simple and direct way. Because your word of your testimony is huge. You know, if I start talking about, hey, I have a friend who had an experience that he knew somebody that did such and such. That doesn't really carry a whole lot of weight. But when I talk about with the reality, it's real. I didn't make it up. It's real. I talk about what happened to me. That's got power in it. And the blood of the Lamb, because who cleanses me from all sin? It's the blood of the Lamb. What's given to them to bring them into life? The blood of the Lamb, right? Okay, so you've overcome the wicked one. So we got this again. This is the new, the new thing. We started in 2 verse 1, said, I've written unto you, I, I write unto you that you sin not. Now he says, I've written unto you children and, and fathers and young men for all these reasons. And just basically saying, you've done all the things I've talked about before. Now, here we go. Now he's going to talk to us. We're all at that point. We've all received, we've all believed, we've all come to that place where we've been made brand new in him, right? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If many man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. These are the new, new, part of the new commandment. Love not the world. It's a command to us. It's direction to us. It's how do I live in this life that he's given me? How do I live in it? And the first things I gotta do is love not the world. Just don't love it. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but it's of the world. And the world passes away. In other words, the world will come to an end. The world will be destroyed. The world will die. And the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God, abides forever. So again, it's that same, 
people need to hear this. Every, there are many people out there that walk around and go, well, I'm a good person, everybody, you know, everybody that's a good person and nice to people, and we're all just going to go to heaven someday, and, and, I, and you know, I'm going to watch the great all-star baseball team in heaven and the, and the wonderful whatever else, and my favorite musicians are all there having a great time, and you know, whatever else. People will say all this kind of nonsense. The Bible makes it very clear there are two classes of people. There are, is the, the wide and broad and commonly taken way that leads to destruction, and there's the straight and narrow and very seldom taken way that leads to life. And the two don't meet, they, don't, they aren't mixed. There's one way and there's another way. You can turn to the left or the right. You can go straight on ahead with God or you can turn back to the world. However you want to say it, there are two paths that you can go by. Okay? The world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God abides forever. They that believe will be saved. They that believe not will be damned. That's, that's where that word comes from. Okay? So everybody understands. <clears throat> Little children, it is the last time. And as you've heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest. They are not all of us. In other words, the dichotomy is real. You're either, you know, for us or against us. You're either with us or you're not. That's what that just said. It's absolutely clear. And people have to know, which path are you on? Where are you going? And in the long run, they don't all come together. That's what people think. Oh, I'm, I'm doing this for a while, but eventually we'll all get to the same place. All roads lead to heaven, right? No, they don't. The most commonly taken road leads to destruction. So we got that clear. I think we all knew that, but hey, it's fun to, to lay it out. Verse 20, but you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. Oh my. I know all things because I have an unction from the Holy One. I learned that the Lord anointed us to speak his word. Every one of us, he's anointed us to speak his word. We are so used to comparing ourselves among ourselves that we begin to try to think, oh, I gotta do it like this one, or I gotta do it like that, and if I can't meet up to this artificial standard I've set in my mind. No, you have an unction from the Holy One, you know everything. Because he wrote his word in your heart. Right there. The only reason it gets messed up is because you keep loving the world. So many things in the world. So much stuff that we get in there. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, because you know the truth, and no lie is of the truth. Who's a liar? But the one that denies that Jesus is the Christ? Question mark? He is Antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. People say, well, I follow the same God as you do. I'm just not sure about Jesus. No, you have to, no, you can't do it that way. You, you can't say, well, I serve the same God you do. Oh, oh, good, you worship Jesus. I love that Pastor Mark telling that story about the taxi driver. You know, oh, that means, oh, you worship Jesus too. <laughs> Knowing full well, that's not what the guy meant. But it sure got the conversation going, right? Whosoever denies the Son, the same has not the Father. But he that acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. If that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, you also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. So let what abide in me? The life. That which was from the beginning, the eternal life that's been promised unto us. Jesus said, I abide in you and you in me. Right? Abide in me. I abide in you. Right? You'll ask what you will. It shall be given unto you. That's what he's talking about here. If that which you heard from the beginning remains in you, you continue in the Son and in the Father. You have the Son, you have the Father also. And this is the promise that he's promised us, even that which is from the beginning, the eternal life. This is the promise. Really, what we really want is the life. What did he give Adam? He gave him the life. He breathed in him the breath of life, made him a living soul, and Adam had the life. He never was supposed to die. He never should have died. 
but he chose rebellion, he chose sin, he joined with the devil in rebellion against the Father, and death passed upon all men so that all have sinned. I'm another quote out of Romans. These things, verse 26, have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. They had the same problem then that we have now. There's a whole bunch of false teachers going out seducing people with lies. We read in Galatians last time that the whole problem in the Galatians church is they were being seduced by lies taught by Judaizers that wanted them to come under the law of Moses in order to be saved. And he made it very clear to them that not only does that not help you, it in fact takes your salvation away. And I struggle that I need to get you born again again, basically. Um, that's pretty intense. In the same way, he says, why is John writing this? He says, I am writing this concerning them that seduce you. You know, there's nothing wrong with telling people, I'm trying to counteract that seducing lion thing that keeps talking to you. It's okay to do that. But the anointing which you received of him abides in you, and you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. Holy Ghost is the earnest, the first fruits of our inheritance is given unto us to give us all things. He's come to reveal to us the word. He's come to convince us of sin. Do I need to be convinced of sin? Yes, because I need to repent. Do I need to be convinced of sin because he's trying to show me that I'm a sinner every day, you dirty, rotten thing? No. But if I sin, I need to know that I sin so I can repent. And he empowers me to repent. It is so much better to humble yourself and repent than it is to defend yourself. That never does anything good. And even as it taught you, you shall abide in him. And now little children abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, do we know that Jesus is righteous? Yes. yes. You know that everyone that does righteousness is born of him. You see somebody doing righteousness, they're born of God. Righteousness, it's amazing, it's, I mean, it's incredible. So, so just because we're going to move into another section, I want to recap just a little bit and ask again for questions. Notice we started at, we're talking about the life, eternal life. In eternal life, there is nothing except for righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's, what's, that's it. This is the kingdom of God. Life that is life indeed is the life of Christ Jesus, the same life that was in him from the beginning by which all the worlds were made. That same life. This is what's being declared to you. This life is for you. It's for you. All you. What do you have to do? You just believe and ask. Just call upon his name, you'll be saved. It's that simple. And he gives you the life. Now you learn to walk in the light. So you walk in the light as he is in the light, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from all sin. It's that simple. You choose, to, oh Lord, I'm going to go in the light. I'm going to choose your way. I'm going to turn away from the ways of the world. I'm not going to love the world. I'm going to turn to you. Do you see the summary of all this? Is all that's saying. Sometimes we get lost in the words, and we just miss the point. Life has been given unto you. The same way he looked at Adam, breathed on him, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, boom, Adam became a living soul, a living being, fully alive to God. Same way Jesus comes to you, gives you his life. He gave it to you. He didn't ask you. All he did was respond to your heart saying yes, and then boom, he gave it all to you. Did you understand what he did? No. I didn't understand. When I got born again, I had no clue what happened. But I knew something happened. I knew I was different. And my whole life's direction changed. Not in the, all the obvious things. There's obvious things that you might change. But it was just deep in my heart. My heart now is hungry for God. Whereas before, it, it hadn't been as hungry for God. Suddenly it was like, oh, there's a God to know. There's a life to receive. I want that. And then as you go after it, little children, you start to learn. Your sins have been forgiven you. You start to learn that you can know him, and he wants to be known of you. And then you start to know that he's made you strong, and he's put his word in you so you can overcome all the works of the devil. Right? And then when you learn how to overcome him, when he's taught you and you've gained the, the understanding that he's empowered you to overcome the works of the devil, now he's going to teach you how to go out and overcome the works of the devil and everybody else. All right? Impressive. Okay. Any questions about one and two? Everybody understands. So if I ask you, what is the theme of the first two chapters? It's 
the life of Jesus. That's what it is. That's what he's talking about. So behold, now behold. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Whoa, whoa, he's given us his life, but he's not only given us his life. He's called us the sons of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it knew him not. It did not know him. Behold, now are we the sons of God, and it doesn't yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Wow, that's intense. Where have we seen that kind of thing? We've seen it in Moses when he wanted to see the Lord in the fullness of his glory, and he allowed him to see his back parts, and when he did that, he went by for him and declared his name, the name that we're talking about in Exodus 34. We've seen that. We've seen that um, uh, they saw Jesus transfigured on the mountain of transfiguration. So we've seen, we've seen glimpses of this, but there's going to come a day where we see him in the fullness of all his glory in that way. We, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when we shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone that has this hope, everyone that has this expectation in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. Does that mean that you are working on getting the sin out of your life? No, it doesn't, because he took care of that already. So what is, how do I purify myself? By loving not the world by hungering for the things of the kingdom, the things of his word, the things of the spirit, and not hungering for the things of this world. That's how I purify myself. I'm purifying myself. You could say I'm purifying myself in consecration. I'm choosing to go his way. I'm spending every day crying out to him, saying, Lord, lead me. Lord, guide me. Lord, teach me. Holy Spirit, show me. Father, help me to love. Lord, Fill me up with your love like I've never been filled up before. Help me to love my brethren. Help me to love those that are in need. Father, help me to minister to souls. Help me to preach to people. Help me to give them the word. And Lord, once I've delivered the word, let me pray over the thing. And say, Father, bless that word. Lord, make them come. Bring them to the church. Bring them. Um, Lord, can, can I go get them? What, you know, whatever it might be. But you're constantly, constantly walking before him. That's how you purify yourself. That's purity. Purity, when you're set aside to God. You know, when you look at the concept of holiness in the Old Testament, we took a cup. I could take two cups from over there, and I could take one of them, and I could just use it for my own uses. It's not a holy cup. I could take the same cup, or a cup very much like it, and set it apart for use in the kingdom. It's now a holy cup. Was, was the one cup made better than the other cup? Is there somehow some different material in the one cup versus the other cup? No, it's, it's consecration unto holy things was what made the difference, okay? So purify yourself even as he is pure. Now we understand, there's people saying, I'm still laying aside the weight of the sin that does so easily beset me, thinking that's purifying yourself. And no, no, do that when you get born again. Now, purify yourself in consecration. Purify yourself by setting yourself apart unto the word. Setting yourself apart unto prayer. Setting yourself apart unto seeking God in everything that you do. Do it as unto the Lord. Right? Whosoever commits sin transgresses also the law. Notice the way he said that. Transgresses also the law. Remember, sin existed whether the law existed or not. Sin was in the world before the law. It was in the world after the law because the law had no power to remove sin. All it could do was declare the sin. All it could do was show you your sin. That's all it did. So he that sins also transgresses the law for sin is the transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abides in him sins not. Whosoever, abide, whosoever sins has not seen him, neither known him. Remember, we're back to those same things. Abiding him, him, knowing him. These are things that we want to have in our life. And he's showing us the difference between those who know him and those who don't, and those who abide in him and those who don't. He's just going to keep on using these same themes. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. He that commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sins from the beginning. 
For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he's born of God. That's intense. I'm sorry, what? This is chapter 3, verse 9. He that's born of God does not commit sin. But he just said earlier on, my little children, if you, I, I write unto you that you sin not, but if you sin, we have an advocate. Right? But he said, if I was born of God, I, can't, I, I won't commit sin. It just says that right here. Does not commit sin. Okay. What are we, what's left there? What has to be there? You still have the choice. The choice. You walk in the way that, like Peter says, if you do these things, you will never stumble. Like I said earlier, that you will not stumble. You walk according to the way that he calls you to walk. You put your trust in him. You let him lead you. You let him guide you. You, don't, you will never sin. I believe that. You'll never sin. You just won't. You don't ever have to sin another time in your life. Will God still be shaping you? We used to be teaching you greater consecration. We used to be teaching in maturity teaching you how to walk with him, teaching you to accomplish the things that he's called for you to do? Yeah. Are you going to grow up? Yeah. But you don't ever have to sin. Ever. You don't have to. I mean, to me, that's an empowerment. It's like, whoo-hoo, I don't have to sin. It's a wonderful thing. Not a pressure-packed, I'll never get up to the top of that hill. (laughs) It's just too much. Maybe when I was 20, I could do that. I can't do that anymore. You know, just whatever it might be. You just begin to, to look at it as an insurmountable goal. Don't look at it as an insurmountable goal. Look at it as a glorious free gift that he gave unto you. Verse 10, In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever does not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loves not his brother. So we're back to that one again. For this, this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. This is the message. This, we heard from the beginning, you should love one another. This is in Genesis that you should love one another. Because he brings an example from Genesis. Not like Cain, who was of that wicked one and slew his brother, and why did he slay him? Why did he kill his brother? Because his own works were evil and his brothers were righteous. That was the reason that he did it. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we've passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loves not his brother abides in death. You having trouble loving? Repent quickly and ask the Lord to fill you with love. Because it tells you right here that you know you pass from death to the life because you love the brethren. You know, and I'll be honest with you, and I think you could all say the same, we don't have any trouble loving one another here. We love one another. Right? There's no no problem. It's very easy to love our brethren here. It's very easy to do. Right? Right? We just love one another. And if there's any place that gets between us, there's a place where there's a little bit of a division, the enemy tries to get an advantage over us, what do we do? Father, forgive me and bless them. And it just makes it all right. It just makes everything right. Whosoever hates his brother, verse 15, is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in them. How do you know that? Because the scripture told you that if you murder, it's, it keep you out of the kingdom of God. It's like it told you that all those other things, envy and hatred and, and strife and all the sexual nonsense, all of it, it's right there. It tells you, this, this keep you out of the kingdom of heaven. So you know no murderer, and I'm going to tell you that if you hate your brother, you are a murderer. Wow. Did you need to know that? You did. So you'd repent of being a murderer, and you'd stop being a murderer. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Wow, lay down your life. Who else is told to lay down their life for somebody? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, right? It's the same command. This is what it's talking about. Verse 17, whoso has this world's good and sees his brother has need and shuts up his bowels of compassion for him, how dwells the love of God in him? He's saying, let's get it down to practical. This is kind of like a James thing. I'll show you my my faith by my works. You say you have faith, I'll show you my faith by my works. In other words, 
if you see somebody has need and you say you love them, but you, you put blinders on so that you don't have, you know, if I don't know about it, I won't have to deal with it. <laughs> if, then you're not loving your brother. So you have a testimony in yourself of you need to repent and get it right. And now you probably need to go give them twice what God told you to give them. Whatever it was, okay? Because <laughs> you just need to get over it. All right. Marvel not, my brother. Where was I? 18. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. That's what we were just talking about. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. You want to be assured? You want to know that you're going to stand before him in that day? Him saying, well done, my good and faithful servant, because you're in Christ Jesus, the perfect, good and faithful servant. You want to do that? And, and this is what you want to, we're going to assure our hearts for. If our heart condemns us, God's greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart condemns us not, then we have confidence towards God. If you feel convicted about the fact you didn't love somebody like you should, get it right. Get it right. I'll tell you one way you need to get it right. If you think that somebody should have done more for you than they did, repent. Okay? It's the same thing. It goes both ways here. Beloved, if our heart condemns us not, then we have confidence towards God. You want to share your heart before him? Do what he tells you to do. Love one another. You want to be assured? Love one another. That's it. I mean, it starts with just hug one another and tell them how much you love them and tell them to be blessed in Jesus' name. That's a, that's a good beginning, right? Beloved, if our heart condemns not, we have confidence towards God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments. Remember John? He says, um, he, he tells us that whatsoever we ask, he shall do it. He shall give it unto us. Whatsoever we ask. If we abide in him and he abides in us. He's telling us again. Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he taught us to, as he gave his commandment. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another with the same love I loved you with. That's, what his, that's his commandment. Man, I mean, when you read this, you come to one conclusion. You are going to be judged by how you love. Yeah. It's basically what it's all about. He that keeps his commandments dwells in him and Jesus in you, or he in him. And hereby we know that he abides in us by the spirit which he's given us. So here's another way of knowing. The earnest of our inheritance, the first fruits of our inheritance, he gave us of his spirit. He gave him to be with us forever. This is one of the ways that we know. Remember in the book of Acts, when Peter went, because God directed him to, and he went to Cornelius' house, and all those that were with him said, they must receive the life of God as well because we saw them baptized in the Holy Ghost just like we were. It was a testimony to them. How did they know? We know he abides in us. They knew that he abided in them because of the spirit that he given them. It's a testimony. You, you must have it. You must have the manifestation of Christ Jesus in your life by the Spirit. And then it's going to assure you, you're going to know. You've got fruits that show that you've been changed because of the Spirit that dwells in you. Right? Okay. Beloved, now we're going to talk about spirits. So it's, a new, it's a kind of a new subject. So with, before we do that, anybody have a question about loving another? Anybody having trouble loving everybody? Because if I'm having trouble... For any reason, even the slightest thing, I know where my source is. Lord, help me. Strengthen me. Fill me with your love. That's all I have to do. It's just that simple. And he is faithful to do it. He just does it. Just, you can't even explain how it comes. Just Suddenly you've got a love for them that you didn't have before. He'll just fill it, fill you with it. And when you experience that love that he gives, you say, oh, that's what you mean. That kind of love. Oh my, that's impressive, right? So we don't, we don't get jealous of one another, do we? No, because love doesn't do that. We read 1 Corinthians 13 and we begin to look at how love is and we look at how we love one another. You know, people want to put it in marriage. It's great in marriage. Keep it there. That's great. But it's for everything. That, that love he's talking about isn't how we live in our marriage life. It's how we live with every one of our brethren. Pretty intense, isn't that? It's good. All right. Any questions about chapter three? Yes, sir. 
Okay, he wants me to look back at verse 20 and, and do that again. So let's go back. If our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. This is in reference to what came right before. My little children, verse 18, let us love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed, not in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we're of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater. So he's talking about what he said in 17, really, where he said, if you see your brother has need and you shut up your bowels of compassion from him, how dwells the love of God in you? And so when he says, if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart. Look, look if you recognize you aren't loving like you should, believe me, God recognizes it more clearly than you do. So you recognize right there you need to love somebody. And then you better go make it right as quickly as you can. Now making it right is going to take different forms and different situations or whatever has need of. But if you have a problem with your brother, sometimes what you need to do is go repent and tell them, I, you know, I'm so sorry, I, I mistreated you. I held evil thoughts. We read here in James, remember when we were reading about how we judge people in James? And we read that you, when you judge people with your own judgments, it is sin to you. When you look at people and you judge them because you, the way they weigh their hair, the way they look, or in today's world, the color of your skin, or, or whatever it might be, and we have, these, we have these judgments against people, and you're not part of my group, and you're a different group, and I don't like you, you know, that kind of thing, those judgments are sin. So that's really what's If you recognize in your heart that you hold respect of persons, you judge one to be special to you and the others you don't care about. You're my friend, but the rest of them, we exclude them. You know, like all the little girls always do. Probably the boys too, but, <laughs> but the, it's, it just seemed to me more calm with the girls. And, and the thing was, is you, you know, you're, you're excluding the ones that you, you're just, they're not part of us. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> You've seen it, every, right? We've all seen it. We've watched it happen, right? That's sin. And it needs to be repented of, right? We don't exclude anybody. We call them all. But neither does it mean that when you include people that you have to be partaker of their evil deeds. Never forget, people get this wrong sometimes. Oh, I've got I've to do what they do then. No! To love them is to call them out of darkness and into his marvelous light. To love them is to give them the opportunity. God so loved the world and he gave everyone an opportunity, but not everybody availed themselves of it. Do you understand? So it's really about where you are in including everybody. There's not a single one of you that can't come here. I don't stand at the door and go, you, I don't want you here, you leave, you're okay, come on in. Right? I mean, this, this is not a place for that. There will be a day when those who go through the door that is Christ Jesus will enter and those that do not will be left without. That, will, that day will come. That's God's judgment to make. But for now, right now, the door's open. He's crying to everyone near and far, come, 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 come. There's no one left out. But you don't have to go be partakers of their evil deeds to love them. That's the opposite of loving. That's reaffirming them in their sin. So I just want to make a little sidelight, make sure we understand that when we talk about these things, sometimes people get the wrong idea in their head. There is a worldly, inclusive like, we'll call it, a, sort of a worldly um, level of loving people that you're supposed to have. Oh, we don't condemn anybody. We just accept everybody for who they are. That's not what we're talking about. Okay, that's not it. Absolutely not. We don't include everybody and accept everybody like they are, but we do call everybody, no matter where they are, to come and be changed. Yeah. You understand? So that's, that's love. But if your brother, this is talking about your brother. If I see my brother has need, and I just kind of go, don't want to know about it, because I really don't have time for that today. I see my brother has need, and I shut up my bowels of compassion from him. How does the love of God dwell in me? It doesn't. It just doesn't. Right? So then it says, if your heart condemns you, God's greater than your heart. If you recognize it, believe me, he does too. So get it right. Repent. Does that, does that help? Yes. A lot of times people think, you know, if I, if I ever did anything wrong, I messed up, you know, I, I misquoted a scripture, you know, somehow I'm condemned. 
We don't want to live in condemnation, okay? <laughs> this is not about every little thing where you just you did it wrong, you said it wrong, and so you got to walk around being condemned and beat up and talk about what a loser you are. That's not what that's talking about. People have used it that way. You know, your heart condemns you. If you, you know what a dirty, rotten sinner you really are. God knows it too. Don't try to... Be. Remember, if you say you have no sin, then, you know, you're a liar. And th that's not what this is talking about. Okay, I, I beat it to death, but everybody follows. You yeah. got it? Okay. And it's important that you know these things. It's important that you pour over the Scripture and ask the Holy Ghost to show you so that when it comes up, you're able to answer very quickly. Yeah. You just have a, a, a very simple answer. Like I said, the very simple answer to me to when somebody starts saying that, say, amen, I thank the Lord that Jesus came and washed me clean. Because, yeah. boy, I did I need him. Yeah. And I need him every day. You just disarmed him. I'm so glad that I have an advocate with the Father that if I sin, but you know what? I'm even more glad that he filled me up with his righteousness so that I could walk like him. <laughs> you know? just, and then they're just stuck because you didn't disagree with them. You just took it where it belongs. That's the, that's the way I like to answer. Okay, chapter four. Beloved, beloved, I love you all so much. Believe not every spirit but try the spirits whether they're of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. So what is that talking about? Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Did Jesus Christ have an earthly body? Yes. Yes. Amen. He did. Was it sinful? No. Was it in the likeness of sinful flesh? Yes. yes. He had an earthly body too just like you do. Was he tempted in all manner like as you were? Yes. yes. We know that that's true, because the scripture tells us that that's true, right? Yeah. But I'll tell you where else he dwells. He dwells in me. And I've always understood this to be say, any spirit that doesn't confess that Jesus dwells in my flesh is not of God. Yeah. Okay? I'm not leaving the other one off. It's true that he came in an earthly body and he died and laid down his life. That's true. And, and certainly if somebody said that never happened, I mean, they're really messed up. Yeah. But I believe what it's talking about, and we're going to see how this flushes out as time goes on, using a pun. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God, this is the spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. You are of God, little children, have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you, in other words, Jesus that's in your flesh, than he that is in the world. That's why I believe that that's what it's talking about. Because the scripture tells me that. Greater is he that's in you. You're of God, little children. You know you're of God, little children. Your heart is assured because you know that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Any spirit that does not confess that Jesus has come in my flesh is not of God. Okay. So if I look at you and say, Jesus is not in you, it's not of God. Now, if I come to you and say that because you are dead in your sins and you need to be born again, it's a different thing. Yeah. But we need to understand that the spirit of Antichrist goes forth trying to tell you Jesus is not in you. Because, you know, after all, you're such a loser. And after all, you're just such a stumbler. And you keep making mistakes and your brain just ain't smart enough to keep up with everybody else. And you just don't apply yourself enough and you keep making mistakes. And this is, the, this is what the enemy does. Keeps trying to tell you Jesus is not in you. He's in you. He's in you. He came in you not because of what you did, because of what he did. All you did was ask him, and he came in you. Now the, the Jesus is in you is greater than he that's in the world. So you have the power, you have the authority to not love the world and instead to love your brothers. So don't believe every spirit. There are lots of spirits out there trying to deceive people and talking about things and wrestling the scripture to their own destruction and twisting things and they come to seduce you, which is the subtleness of seduction to draw you into that which is sin, right? It's very important that we know the greater is he that is in us because they are of the world. They speak of the world and the world hears them. I mean, I, I don't... I, I don't even want to talk about that. I, hear, I, I heard some things that just, just appalled me. I mean, the things that people say, the things that people do in the name of politics is just absolutely appalling to me. 
It's just out of control. The nonsense. We, we shouldn't even be involved in that stuff because of these things. Just, just know. Speak the word. Just speak the word. Greater he that's in me than he's in the world. And the world hears them and follows them because they're not of us. And they're going to do what they do. Sorry. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world. The world hears them. We are of God. And he that knows God hears us. He that's not of God does not hear us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. John is basically testifying, and we can really testify. When we speak by the word of God, if you, if you come against the word of God, you're not of us. There may be times when the word of God hits me hard, and I suddenly go, oh my. It may be a little overwhelming. But you know what the heart that is soft before God does? Oh Lord, help. I need some help. I, didn't re I just didn't realize. I mean, th that's really the, the, the humble heart. The broken heart. Blessed are the broken in heart. The, the pure in heart. Those whose heart is just, Lord, I want your ways and nothing else. They've set themselves apart unto purity. Lord, I want to walk with you. I don't want to walk in the world. Right? Okay. Oh, Lord, help us. We are of God. Here been over the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Verse 6. That's how we know. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that loves not knows not God, for God is love. So we're back on the love thing here. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son in the world that we might live through him. Remember, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son. This is the testimony that we have that we can say. People say, how do I know God loves me? Because he sent Jesus. God told us more than one place, that's what it is. He sent Jesus to die for you. That's the love of God manifested to you. If you can't see it any other way, that you can see it in. Okay? Here in his love, verse 10, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Remember earlier it said he is the propitiation for our sins? We have an advocate with the Father. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. I mean, he, he is just hitting this thing. He's telling us, look, the, you want to know and have your heart assured before God you're in the faith? You want to know that you're in the kingdom? You want to know you're on the straight and narrow way? You want to know you're in the right place? You want to know that he dwells in you? Keep his commandments and love one another. Because what is his commandment? Love one another. Right? <laughs> this is it. I've, I've sang this song many times here when I've got an opportunity to preach or whatever, one of the earliest Abiding Place songs, which is, love one another, even as I have loved you. It's one of my first memories of when the, the, the first of us were coming together and beginning to, to fellowship together in the Word of God. And Pastor Mark, who then was not Pastor Mark, he was just Mark, until he became Pastor Mark, and, and there really was a change, and it's a very important change, but... And he's playing his guitar, and he's singing, Love one another, even as I have loved you. Fulfill you my joy, and live in harmony too. With fervent love, sincere love, doing good, even when you are despitefully used. For this is the will of our Father in heaven. And it goes on. I mean, it's one of the first things that I remember. And it, it really is the cry of the Spirit for us to love one another. It's just imp important. All right, verse 12. No man has seen God at any time. Is that true? Well, it's in the Word of God. <laughs> so it's true, but what is it saying? Because we know that Abraham saw God. We know that Moses talked to him face to face. We know that 70 of the elders of Israel, or even more than that, sat down and had dinner with them on the mountain. They sat and ate with them. God was at the head of the table. They were sitting at the table with God, having a meal. Right? We know this. Is Jesus God? John saw him. John dwelt. John put his head on his breast. So what is it telling us? Because it's clearly not true that nobody's ever seen God in some fashion. 
So what's it talking about? No man's seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he's given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love and he that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. What's he talking about when he says no man has seen God at any time? We have not seen him in the fullness of his glory because remember earlier it said, in that day we will see him, we will know that we know him because we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. That has to be what he's talking about. There isn't anything else he could be talking about because he goes right back to telling us about love. This, this fellowship that we have with him is by what? It's by the Spirit. This fellowship we have with him, we still dwell in this earthly body and we still have a place where we have not the full manifestation of seeing him. Though some have, and many of us here may, as even in this earthly body, see him. But there's going to come a day when we shall see him as he is in the fullness of his glory. Did you have a question? John 1.18 18 says? Has declared him. That's in the, in the book of John. 1.18 says a similar thing. What did Jesus do? He declared the Father. So what I want you to understand is people will say, get tripped up on these things. One of the things I'm trying to do is just help you with some of the English phrasing that we get tripped up on. Understand, when it says no man has seen God at any time, you have to understand it in the context of the book, right? And there is a seeing of God that no, we have, we have not. Because there's going to come a day where we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And the way I describe that is in the fullness of his glory. And we know that Moses saw him like that, but he saw his back parts he didn't see him face to face. He saw him face to face, but he didn't see him face to face in the fullness of his glory. That's the only thing that we can say. That's how we have to understand it. Because to say that nobody had ever seen God just doesn't even make sense. Because we know lots of people have. And people make, build all sorts of doctrines and theologies on what this means. But I think what I was reading the rest of it for was just to show you, it's not meant to be a struggle because he goes right into talking about love. You know what the manifestation of God in you is? You love one another. You know, the, you know how you see God? In the way that we love one another. That's the point he's making. Okay? It's not that everybody who comes to God has to have the opportunity to go up and shake his hand at the front and have a discussion with him. No, that's not it. How's he going to see him? Jesus declared to us the Father. You're now supposed to go do the works of Jesus. What are you supposed to show? The works of Jesus. What does that do? It declares the Father. This is the purpose. The purpose, how are men going to know? How are they going to see? How are they going to understand the love of the Father? Because you're going to show it to them. Does that, do you now understand why that scripture is there? Yeah. That was my, my point, is that's why it's there, is to help you understand that Jesus manifested the Father. We now know that the life of Jesus is in us, and because the life of Jesus is in us, we keep his commandments, and his commandment is to love one another, and because you love one another, you're gonna manifest the Father just like Jesus did. When you see a person in torment, because she's bent over like this and has been for 35 years or whatever, and she can't walk and can't stand up, and you cast the devil out and she can stand up, believe me, you're showing the love of the Father, right? And we hear that and we go, man, that's so cool. Wish I could do that someday. That's what we do. Well, Jesus is in me. The same Jesus that did that is in me. How do I begin to flow in that which is Jesus in me? I love the brethren. How do I grow up in God? I love the brethren. Because I love the brother and I begin to pray for them. I begin to not do things that hinder them. I begin to not cause trouble. My brother's going to step out in faith, but I'm over here undermining his faith because I'm constantly telling him how bad he is and how many stupid things he's done and how I don't like the way he does this or that or the other thing. And so I'm, what am I doing? I'm robbing him of where he can go. And this is, the church is full of this. 
where we see somebody begin to step out in God and then we pull them down because we don't want us, ourselves to look bad. I'm not saying, Lord, forgive me if I ever did that. But Lord is telling us we need to love one another. And when we love one another, we're going to strengthen one another. And when we love one another, we're going to manifest the love of Christ through us, the love of Jesus through us. And when we do that, we're going to show forth the works of the Father, which are the love. And out of that, the body of Christ is going to begin to minister to people that are outside of it to bring them in and to set them free. And manifestations are going to happen. It's really best done that way. It, it's, it is best done as a body, not just an independent combat unit. It just, it really is. Now, God will save by one. That's all he's got. That's what he used. But the manifestation we're supposed to have of loving one another is because we, have, we function as a body. This has been the, the cry around here for a long time. One body, one spirit, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father above all. The manifestation of Christ Jesus in the earth is his body. What does the body of Christ go forth to do? Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, right? But so many of us start making it like it is in school where it's, uh, well, we're all competing for the best grade and we can't all get it. No, in this one, we're all running to win and we can all win, okay? And we're gonna love one another because we're gonna help each other to win. Does it matter to me if I'm the toe and you're the thumb, right? Does it matter to me? That the, the toe doesn't give as much, get as much honor as the thumb? Does it matter? No. It doesn't matter because every part is functioning where it's supposed to function. Every part is important. You know, we, can, we all have a part in so many things. God wants to give us a greater part. God wants to mature us to a greater extent. But the goal isn't to just tear the body apart and make us all independent people. That's not the goal. The goal is that we all flow together. They function as a body. Remember, Ephesus, this mighty church, I mean, it had Paul there. It had Timothy there. It had um, uh, John was there. That's, man, that's an intense church. You know, it's like the who's who was there in Ephesus. The whole body functioning together. Anyway, I digress quite a bit, but I wanted you to get this because it's just one of those places that people get all twisty turned around as they read the scripture. God, no one's seen God at any time. How can that be? I don't understand. It must be a contradiction. It's no contradiction. Okay? And is everybody able to see that? You want to manifest God in the world? What are you going to do? Love one another. That's what you're going to do. That's the beginning. Just love one another. That's what we do. All right. And the dwells in love, he that dwells in love dwells in God. This is the end of verse 16, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. That says it pretty clearly. You are the manifestation of Christ Jesus in the earth. You. There's no fear in love. Oh, we just trying to, this is a little bit different subject. We're talking about love one another. Guess what? There's not, not in love. There's no fear. But perfect love casts out fear. Because fear is tormentuous. He that fears is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. We didn't start this. We didn't come up with love on our own. It was not a great philosophical idea that five of us sat around and come up with. John didn't do this on his own. We love because God loved us. He showed us love and then told us to go love one another with the same love he loved us with. That was Jesus' final commandment to us. Right? Everybody got that? I mean, by the time we're all done, you're going to all know that so clear you understand. He told me to love one another with the same love he loved us with. Got it? Yeah. All right. We love him because he first loved us. Does a man say, I love God and hates his brother? He's a liar. For he that loves not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment have we from him that, we, that he who loves God love his brother also. Here's the commandment. Finally brought down, boom, love one another. So, any questions about chapter four? But I hope I didn't confuse you with all that stuff about seeing God. But you all got the point, right? You understood? I was just praying you all get that. Yeah. that. Because I just wanted you to hear so clearly that you're the manifestation of Christ Jesus on the earth. No man's seen God at any time. 
but he's manifested in his church. That's cool. Any other questions about chapter 4? Everybody's good because we're on the last one. This is powerful, just amazing. The letter that John's writing. Verse 1, chapter 5, Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Remember we talked about how Jesus died and he gave you life and just like God breathed into Adam and gave him life? Here it is right here. Whosoever believes Jesus Christ is born of God. That's it. All you have to do to be born from above is to believe. You just need to hear the word and go, yes, I agree with that. That's it. It's simple. You don't have to get people to do a bunch of gyrations. You don't have to get them to go through a specific prayer. You don't have to take them through. Many, those things are all can be useful, helping people understand what happened to them. But really what it comes down to is if they believed and hurt, they'll be born again. The sad thing is many people have been born again because they believe the word, but then the word gets stolen from them because they've been taught many things that are damnable heresies. And that's why he says, I write these things concerning them that seduce you. Beloved, don't believe every spirit. You, you need to understand that there are some things you've got to get right. We've got to keep these clear. So it's why he's saying, it seems like the same thing over and over and over. He makes it really clear. Look, people, if you can't get the love right, forget everything else. You've got to get the love right. And if you recognize you don't have it right, call out to God tell you do. And get the love right. That's the, the message we've had. But he that believes... That Jesus the Christ is born of God and everyone that loves him that begat loves him that's begotten. Whoa. That means that that person who's got all kinds of really dumb ideas, been taught everything that's wrong, comes in, believes the word of God, and gets changed, you love them. They got all kinds of really dumb ideas. They start talking, the first thing you think of is, oh my, where did they grow up? <laughs> right? And then you allow judgment and personal opinion to get in the way of you loving them that's sin to you you don't allow it what do you do when you when you hear the thing you just begin to the first thing you do is begin to say father bless them bless them your words in them fill them up with your spirit fill them with the word that you put in them when you born them from above for lord cause it to come flow out of that pure stream you know and then you know there'll be places for the the leadership to help people. There's times like this. Is why we do these teaching. Why, why do we do this? Just because you're not capable of reading this book on your own? No. The prayer is that the, the anointing of the Holy Ghost would just draw people in to where their heart gets so impacted that just run to do it more. Right? That's why we proclaim the word. It needs to be spoken sometimes. All right. So, yes, we have a question. So you said uh, that believing, just believe that. Yes. Confess with your mouth. Okay, so she's talking about Romans 9 and 10 says, if you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, you shall be saved. Yeah. Okay, well, that's the, that's the response to believing. Yeah. Okay, if I believe it, I'm not going to go, in my heart, I believe it and say, well, I don't think you've got risen from the dead. Okay, that's not going to happen. <laughs> so what happens when you believe something, you say, wow, he got risen from the dead. That's amazing. That's going to come out of your mouth. Right, and you're going to confess, and so it's true because we were just—I was just saying that you know these words need to be confessed with our mouth, they need to be spoken with our mouth. In the same way, testifying of salvation is very important. How do you overcome the wicked one? The word of your testimony, the blood of the lamb. The blood of the lamb may wash you clean; you may be born again, but now you need to begin to proclaim it. It needs to come out of your mouth. You need to say it. I remember when I got born again, first thing I did was start to tell somebody about what just happened to me and about the word of God that I just learned and how awesome it was. Nobody told me to do that. It just, that's what I did. Because I believe that's what everybody does when they first believe is because they get so, it's like, I just got given this incredible gift. Look at this thing. It's amazing. You can have one too. They're giving away free cars over at the car lot over there. All you have to do is go over and get one. How many people would be getting up and running over there? All right. Yeah. It, it's just, it, I got the greatest gift ever, and it's free, and you can have one too. That's, that's what you pretty much do, right? Whoops. Okay. So th that answers the question, right? This we know, by this we know, verse 2, that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. So we're back to that one, remember? How do we know that we're in him? We keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. 
For whosoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. I'm an overcomer. Jesus said in Revelation chapter 3, we read that a little while ago. We did Jude, that's the one I was forgetting. We did Jude and we did Revelation 1 through 3. In Revelation chapter 2 and 3, he said, he that overcomes will I give. He that overcomes will have. He that overcomes. He, you got to overcome, right? Well, who, do, who overcomes? The ones that believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That's who overcomes. This is the one that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that bears witness because the Spirit is truth. Spirit's important. Who's going to lead and guide you into all truth? The Holy Ghost. Who's going to comfort you? The Holy Ghost. Who's going to empower you? The Holy Ghost. Okay? For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth. The Spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. So what are we talking about? I'm just going to tell you what we're talking about. Spirit, Holy Ghost, has been given unto you, right? Absolutely. The water of the Word, the washing of the water of the Word, and the blood of the Lamb, right? They're all here to empower us. We've been given all these things freely. We have all of them. They're given to us. And those three agree in one, testifying of the Father and the Word and the Holy Ghost, the Father and Jesus and the Holy Ghost, and that are to all one in heaven, right? If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son. He that believes on the Son of God has the witness in himself. He that believes not God has made him a liar, because he believes not the record that God gave of his Son. There's a little bit of an old English way of saying it. So let me try to say this a little bit different. You, if you receive the witness of men, you, when, when I testify to you, of, you know, it's uh, 75 degrees outside, you, and you know that you, you might believe. I'm testifying to you. I, I went out and took the temperature, it's, it's, you know, or something like that. You, you'll believe the witness of men about things, right? But the witness of God is greater. This is the witness of God that he says by the Son. Here it is. I'm going to tell you, this, this that we're talking about, the witness of God is the Spirit and the water and the blood. It's the Father and the Word and the Holy Ghost. It's the witness of God, and it's greater than the witness of men. And you receive the witness of men, so receive the witness of God. But he, he that believes on the Son of God, you believe on him, now the witness is in you. You have the witness in you. That's the important point that he's trying to make here. He that believes not God makes God a liar. You're saying, it's not true, you're saying God's a liar. Because in the earth right now, spirit, the blood, the water, they're all testifying. And when you get born again, that's in you. And out of you comes that witness. The witness is in you. That's what this is talking about. So you everybody following now and understanding what this is? And you make him a liar because you believe not the record that God gave of his son. Where's the record that God gave of his son? It's in the word of God. Right? Who's revealing the word of God to us? The Spirit. Who's, who's setting us free from the bondage of sin so that we can hear more clearly? The blood. It's washing us clean, right? It's all here. The witness of God is here for anybody who will call upon his name and be saved. Okay? This is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that has the Son has life, and he that has not the Son of God does not have life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have this life, that which is from the beginning, which we have seen, which we've heard, which we've looked upon, which our hands have handled, the word of life. That life has been given to you. You have that life, that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Life is here. That's why you, you know, Pastor Mark, some months ago, maybe a year ago, two years ago, can't remember anymore, began to say that the Lord had put a word in his mouth to go around to the churches and begin to declare, receive the life of Christ Jesus. What, is that some new revelation that nobody had ever heard before? No, it's the word of God that was put in his mouth to speak by authority so that men would receive the life of Christ Jesus. What do you have to do to receive the life of Christ Jesus? Just believe. You believe the testimony. That's that simple. Simple. Just believe it. 
Now you're changed. And then we spend however long it takes convincing people that the change is real, that the reality is real, that God's really moved in, that he's really there for you, the Spirit's really been given to you, that you really can have, you can be baptized in the Holy Ghost, you really can, that you can call upon the Lord for the Holy Spirit and you can receive it. Because he said, if you ask of him for the Spirit, will he give you something else? No, you ask him, he'll give it to you. Simple. All right. Verse 14, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. A second time he said that here, said it in John 15. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know we have the petitions we desired of him. Wow. That's a manifestation. If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, you shall ask, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. Do you realize whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted. Whoever sins you retain, they are retained. Pretty intense. What should I be doing? I should be remitting every sin I can. Father, forgive them. Father, bless them. Father, draw them to repentance. Anything. He said, and he shall ask and give him life for them that sin unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. What is he talking about? What is the judgment for sin? Death. Who paid the price? Jesus. So what is he talking about when he says there is a sin not unto death and there's a sin unto death? I say, don't say you should pray for it. Well, there's only one other scripture that bears on this, and that is the one where Jesus says that if you blaspheme the Father, you'll be forgiven. If you blaspheme the Son, you'll be forgiven. But if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, you will not be forgiven. And so there is a sin that will not be forgiven. Now, many people have struggled. I, I have dealt with this personally, not within me, but in personally with people that I've, I've had to deal with who will come to you and say, I blasphemed the Holy Ghost. God, it's not going to ever have anything to do with me. He just, he's, he hates me now because I blasphemed the Holy Ghost. There's no help for me. Believe me, if you truly blaspheme the Holy Ghost, you wouldn't care. There'd be no convicting power of the Holy Spirit. There'd be no desire to be right. There'd be nothing. So I don't want to leave here with anybody thinking, oh my goodness, what if that happened to me? And oh my goodness, how many people do I know that have blasphemed the Holy Ghost? And I keep, <laughs> look, just don't go there. Okay? <laughs> but he is telling you that you have the power to change the outlook in people. When you see a person sin a sin and it's not that sin unto death, you can pray for them and you can change things. We have not understood that power any more than we've understood how to raise the dead. Because of loving the world too much, because of the cares and riches and pleasures of this life, because of our own selfishness or because of whatever, we've not done what Jesus commanded to do. We can talk about all those things. And you know, when we hear those kind of admonitions, we get a little bit condemned. Don't be condemned. Cry out to God, say, Lord, change me. The first thing we have to learn, what we should be teaching people as soon as they're born again, is listen, everything you need comes from asking the Father. Everything you need doesn't come from asking me for my opinion on how you're supposed to do it. Should I do this? Should I do that? Should I not do this? Should I not do that? Don't ask me your, my opinion. You don't want to know. Go to the Father. The Father will show you. If you start trying to figure it all out in your pea brain, you end up causing yourself trouble and other people trouble too. Go to the Father and ask Him, right? And you pray for people, and when your prayer will go forth and will change their life and cause them to repent when they need to repent. And you will take no credit for it because it's the power of the Holy Ghost in you to love one another. Because remember, when they believed on Jesus, they were born again. And you now love them with the same love that Jesus loved you with. And you don't judge them, like James taught us. You don't judge them according to how you don't like the way they do stuff. You don't judge, you know, it's sin to you. You love them, you bless them, you do not curse them, and you do not take away the convicting power of the Holy Ghost from them, nor do you join in with the condemning power of the enemy against them, right? So, I mean, this, if we get nothing else, that's worth getting. That you may know Verse 13, 
I've written to these that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have this life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Then he talked about how that if somebody sins a sin, how to pray. Verse 18, one of my favorite scriptures, 1 John 5, 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sins not, but he that is begotten of God keeps himself, and the wicked one touches him not. This one's special to me because I remember when I was, Grace and I were first married, and I'm trying to explain these things because she hadn't grown up with these things, and, and, and it was like she read it in the scripture, and, and the Holy Ghost gave her revelation. All my explanation does nothing. Holy Ghost gives a revelation. She sits down at the piano and starts singing. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. I mean, it's incredible. So, so to this day, I can't forget that scripture. It, it will, I can, it's, that's memorized. Cannot forget that one, right? But it, it was glorious. Because the scripture makes it very clear, and it also shows us our responsibility. For he that's begotten of God keeps himself. Remember it said earlier that he that's begotten of God does, does not commit sin? Right? And it said it earlier, but now it's going to flesh it out a little more and can show us how does that happen? Because he that begotten of God, he keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. Where do you keep yourself? In the love of God. How do you keep yourself in the love of God? Anybody know? We've read this here previous weeks. No, that's one way, but that's not the one I'm thinking of. What? Build yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Right? It's another one we've not realized how powerful it is to spend time praying in the Holy Ghost more. Well, however much you do, by some man's measure of time, do it more. Pray in the Holy Ghost more. I, really, we can all pray in the Holy Ghost more. We just need to do it more. And this is what we need to do. Because we're going to keep ourselves. So you want, to, you want to keep yourself from sin? Keep yourself in the love of God, praying in the Holy Ghost. Right? The wicked one will not touch you. We know that we are of God and the whole world lies in wickedness. The whole world. Remember, love not the world. The whole world lies in wickedness. We're of God. We talk about the dichotomy. There's the straight and narrow way. There's the broad and commonly gone way. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him, and that's been said many times in this book, that you may know him. How do you know you know him? You love the brother and you keep his commandments, right? And we, have, we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourself from idols. Amen. Pretty intense, huh? Keep yourself from idols. Pretty intense. The book of 1 John is, is it's concentrated. Every scripture, every verse is intense. And if you haven't got it clear, you, I think you get it now, love one another. The manifestation is you love one another. Because this is the commandment you've been given, that you love one another. How do you keep yourself in the love of God? You pray in the Holy Ghost. I mean, it's all tied together. Every bit of this is all one. What is it? He that, he that purifies himself even as he is pure? How do you purify yourself? You set yourself aside unto loving one another. You consecrate yourself to doing it God's way. You say, I'm going to be for, for holy use, not for profane use. That's holiness. I'm going to set myself. Be holy, for God is holy. I'm going to do his stuff, not my own stuff, right? This really is what it's all about. And how do I do that? I begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. Why do I pray in the Holy Ghost? I'm asking the Holy Ghost to lead me. Holy Ghost, come fill me. Holy Ghost, move through me. Begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. What is it going to quickly turn to? Begin to prophesy. Begin to speak the word of God. Begin to declare his holiness. Begin to declare his, th his thanksgiving. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we praise you. All these things are going to begin to roll out of us. He's going to teach you how to pray. He's going to teach you how to praise. He's going to teach you how to give thanks. All out of the Holy Ghost. So everything that you need, the day you're born again, has been given unto you. He, the, he that begun a good work, you shall bring it unto completion. We know that if we were perfected, if we were born of the Spirit, we are perfected by the flesh, right? No, we're not. There's nothing that we want to do that's of the flesh. We want to do that which is of the Spirit. And out of that, the three that testify together, the Word of God, 
the Spirit of God, the blood of Jesus Christ, they're all given to us to empower us to lead us in the right way. And you don't need any, any man teaches you. you don't need it. Then why have, were teachers given? If we don't need any man to teach, why did God give apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers? For the perfecting of the saints. But, but he just said, you don't need any man to teach you. Why do you need a teacher? The Holy Spirit is given to you, right? Why does he use apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors and teachers? Because we need them. And he recognizes we need them. And they help to direct us. What are they supposed to be doing? Pointing you constantly to Jesus. Pointing you to the Father. Pointing you to the Holy Ghost. Pointing you to the Word of God. Demonstrating for you, showing you, encouraging you, directing you, not to follow them, but to follow Jesus. Not to follow them, but to follow the Holy Ghost. Right? Yeah. So you need them. And I'm very happy that God gave them. And it's God's purpose to give them and to make them be present. He anoints for that purpose. But that's not the goal. It's not like the world where I want to be the next great whatever, so I'm going to go hang out with the next, the current great whatever, so that I can absorb that and then become the next great whatever. We, we think that that's what we're supposed to do. That's the way the world functions. That's not what you're supposed to do. Because the only great whatever that ever existed was Jesus, and he's the one that you're directed to. So if, I remember one time when Pastor Mark said it this way, he said, look, I'm a produce sign pointing you to the fact that the fruit is really good. You can have as much as you want, come to the table and eat. That's what he is, that's what he's He's doing to us. He's declaring to us the word for what purpose? That we would hear it and hear the word of God and then follow him. But too many people in the church have got the idea that I'm trying to make the people around me notice me more. I'm trying to get people around me to, to see how, what, what good is in me or what I have to offer to the program. or I, Whatever it might be. I mean, there's all these things that get us confused because we're not doing the first commandment, which is to love one another. What do you do when you love one another? You lay down your life for them. You do anything for them. You just do anything. What, what can I do for you? How can I help you? How can I love you? And that's what we do. So any questions about 1 John? There should be, never be any confusion again. I want to go back one more time if, there, if I don't see any hands. And I just want to remind you that in 1 John chapter 1 at the end, I want to remind you of this because you need to have this clear because it's the biggest struggle in 1 John is when people come and quote to you 8 and 10. He that has, says he has no sin is a liar, and the truth's not in him. Understand that if people want to know what that means, go read Romans in its entirety, but especially chapters 2 and 3 and a little bit of 4, and you will see what he's talking about. Everybody needs Jesus. And the second scripture when it says, he that says that he has no sin, um, he that says I have no sin makes him a liar. The, the, let me read it. I just quoted it wrong, so I, I, I don't like that. So let's go read chapter 1, verse 10, real fast. Because I want to quote it right. Verse 10. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Right? If you say that you did have not have need of a Savior, if you say that you were not born again, if you say that you did not need to be forgiven, I've never done anything I need to be forgiven of. I mean, look, clearly, you are messed up. You did not get it, Okay? And if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and the word is not in us, is an absolutely true statement, but it is not a proof that you've got sin. Right? It's proof that you needed a Savior. And that's the important thing. And when you understand that, then all the rest of the Scripture makes sense, because the, the whole book of 1 John is filled with, we know that whosoever is born of God does not sin. I write of these things that you don't sin. Right? And keep yourself in the love of God. So, Father, in Jesus' name, this people that we love so much, Lord, this people that you called by your name and brought them out of darkness into your marvelous light, and that you, Lord God, have empowered to love with a love, the same love that you loved with. Lord, you've already given it to each one of us. Lord, you've, you've empowered us to love like this. You've told us to love like this. You've, you've commanded us to love like this. But Lord, not only did you command us, but you empowered us by your spirit and by the very life that you've given us that we would love one another. So Father, if we see a need in our life for greater love, we now know 
repent and call out to you, and we will love one another with the same love you loved us with. Lord, we will love, as Pastor Mark likes to say, in three seconds, began to recognize his need for an even greater love than he had experienced, and instead of trying to make it happen, asked you, and the love came. Father, you fill with love. It's a great testimony of how we're supposed to do it. So each one of us can say the same thing and say, Lord, I recognize the need for love, and Father, I want you to teach me how to love in the first three seconds of meeting somebody. I want to be so filled with your love that it will be a manifestation to them that Christ Jesus is truly in me and in this world to testify of how much he loves them. Father, we thank you for that empowerment, Lord, to make us soul winners, to make us witnesses unto your, your, unto your covenant and unto your life, and Father, to fill us even more with the Holy Ghost, we might pray in the Spirit all the time. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I'm blessed.